I wasn't even aware of the of the anti-Semitism going on there. <laughs> but I remember she said to me, and it was almost as if she was saying something that was positive, which a lot of bigotry is sounds like something positive. And then you're like, wait a minute. She said, um, Jewish men make great husbands. Of course, they all have mistresses. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the, what the Guys, what's up? Today's podcast is brought to you by SeatGeek. Yes, get $20 off your first order when you use my code NASH. Guys, welcome back to the podcast. What's up? Uh, it's the All Good Things podcast. My guest today is an incredible comedian. He's somebody that I've admired for so long. He refused a bottle of water today, which means, which means he is a great person because he, he cares about the environment. That's how great this guy is. This guy, without, without a doubt, 100%. Brings his own bags to Trader Joe's. Oh, my God. Of course, right? <laughs> yes. You must. Yes, of course. Um, I bring my own bags everywhere, and if I forget them, it's, a, yeah, I don't shop. You know. It's, it's more of a neurosis It's Gary Goldman, everybody. Gary oh, Goldman. Gary Goldman. Hi. I, I, Gary, uh, go ahead. What were you going to say? I was going to say that if I, it's more of a neurosis, really. That I mean, it is about climate change and everything like that, but it, then it takes this level of neuroses where, like, one bottle is not going to make a difference here or there no. but uh, I know it's not or a straw like H have you always had a lot of neuroses from the time oh yes I mean it comes out yes. in your comedy obviously yes. but when you were a kid is that how it felt for you yeah you grew I, up in Boston right yeah I grew up outside of Boston in a in a suburb called Peabody I know Peabody yeah North Shore I, yes North Shore and I I got it in my head early on because my mother used to say if I if I was acting up and I stubbed my toe, for instance, on a corner of a cabinet. She would say, see, God punished you. And so I was indoctrinated into this very bizarre religion where God was watching little kids act up and and smiting them and and really? punishing them physically. And, really? and so in my head, I, and as I learned more and more about sins and things at Hebrew school and stuff, I would, I would just be convinced that God was watching me and instantly rendering a verdict and carrying out a sentence. And so I was constantly praying to myself all day long for forgiveness and for, uh, for leniency. And it was just, it, it's just, a, it's, a, it was a very neurotic, anxious period of my life. I wrote a book called Misfit and I yeah. detail my, my, uh, lifelong struggles with, with mental illness. Is that, the book out now? Yeah, it's out. Yeah, it's it, out. It came out in September and it, how's it doing? It's called Misfit. I think it did really well. The first week it was in the, top 10 of nonfiction uh, books and it's been named as one of the best on one of the best books of the year. Oh, congratulations. And, and the other one is Goodreads. Did you do the audio book? I, I did the audio book. <laughs> How yeah. long did it take you? It was uh, four days from <laughs> 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Four days of work and, and I enjoyed it. It was like a it was, it was, I had a director, so it was sort of like a really intense acting yeah. exercise. So I, I really enjoyed it. And what about your father? Was your father that way too? Did he guilt you too? No. No. No, my, my father did have a very good relationship with God and that he was, he was, uh, he obeyed and prayed all the time, but he, he never made me feel that, that my sins or, or behavior was being punished moment to moment, right? Or, right. Or being viewed, it was so generally was a good healthy. upbringing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I think so. I mean, it was a little bit lonely because my brothers were much older than me, and uh. and I had an unusual situation where I I I mean that this tells you a lot about my dad. My dad insisted I repeat the first grade despite the fact that I was in the highest reading group. Sun up. It was called Sun Up. And but he got it he got it he got well, it. was called Lippincott. Oh okay. That was the in That's first so grade. Lippincott. Yeah. I got sent sent out of Lippincott. Yeah. Really? Yeah, to I the, wasn't smart the, enough. 
Wow. Yeah. I got moved into Sun Up after a couple of weeks because I, I already knew how to read. And then my father got it in his head that I would have a tremendous advantage in sports yeah. if I repeated the first grade and didn't really take into consideration the, 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 <laughs> the social catastrophe that that would be. And right. it, so it led to, to just... Uh, I, I didn't really connect with the kids. There was a maturity gap right? the second time through first grade, and I was much bigger than them, and I looked like a teacher's aide <laughs> and the second time through. And so I... I just, it took me a while to make friends and I was, I, I found myself more comfortable with like the older kids in the neighborhood. And yeah, because they my, were your age. Like a lot of youngest children and future comedians, I was, I was precocious. How, precocious like how? Well, my parents and my brothers never talked down to me. Yeah. So I had a, I had a pretty vast vocabulary at a young age and I remember somebody commenting on the fact that I started about 30% of my sentences with apparently. I got I got hooked on apparently really really early and and so I I I had to like kind of code switch code switch with with the kids at school versus the way I was talking at home right. and and around the neighborhood kids it it was just it was very confusing I I think and and so I talked more like a, a an adult or a, or an intellectual yeah, yeah, yeah. than than most of the kids who were still having a hard time saying three. And they would say it free, and and I I was like, what is going on here? It's, there's a we're not Cockney, and this is <laughs> right. So it was yeah, it was very confusing to me. When did you feel like you were like funny? Were you funny growing up? Oh yeah, you were. Yeah, and you yeah. were like a big guy. Did people like want to fight you and stuff all the time? Really? Yeah. And you're so gentle, the, right? Yeah. I I mean that that's another aspect of, of me that I'm this big guy who's incredibly sensitive and yeah. and not really comfortable fighting I, re I remember recently oh the, the the don't the please don't destroy guys made a movie yeah i watched and, it it's oh great. wasn't it so funny so good okay there's a woman who punches guys in the throat yeah and i can understand if you're a woman you should go for the most vulnerable part but the idea of punching somebody in the throat Never occurred to me because I think it is so horrifically violent and couldn't it kill somebody? Yeah. Like I, I just, yes. yeah. So I, I, I never like kids would be punching me in the face or in the stomach, and <laughs> and I would just not even fight back. I, 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 I would just cover up or try to try to um, apprehend, subdue them. Yeah. Um. And and it was just yeah. So and then I became known as kind of an easy mark that you want to get you want to get a few easy wins in. You would, you would right. go after me. So it was just it was a nightmare. But I was a pretty good athlete and then I made all the teams and I you play? and I stood out I, I played basketball for from 10 until until my senior year of high school and then I played basketball and and football and and I didn't play until my senior year of high school but I I I stood out in that I was six foot six and 255 pounds yeah. and 17 years old and so I I had a few good games and my coach sent videos to colleges and and I, I got a numerous scholarship offers to play football with very little experience and really and and, and just not on your much size. just on my size and athleticism not much know-how and and so I, w I wound up playing it at boston college and it and it became a you uh, played football at debacle. boston college yes you did not <laughs> yeah that's a big school i'm yeah. from boston i know boston college that's huge yeah the, at the time they were renowned because they had they had put um Doug Flutie and a Heisman Trophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Flutie so. Pass and Natick. Yeah, yeah, yes, mm. yes. So it was, it was. Uh, yeah, it you're was, not. When I when I met you, you're like it's tough to believe that you're real. Oh, the first I've heard that yeah. ten minutes that I'm talking to you. Yeah, because I'd seen your stand up and loved it, and then we had oh, that walk in the park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember like I remember talking to you. I'm like, yo, is this dude real? Like, is he like a <laughs> real person? Because anybody with your size, yeah, my father's like six three. Oh wow! And everybody that I've known at that size, you know, they just carry themselves in a different way, you yeah. know. But you're like this gentle giant, and so you, when you're talking to you, I'm like, wow, this guy's like so fascinating. Oh, thanks. It's that, really interesting. I, I was able to do well because everybody was so much smaller and slower right. than me. But then when I got to the next level, where everybody had been 
the star of their high school or the or the star of their community since they were a kid. I was I was overwhelmed and and it was it turned out to be a what happened at BC like freshman year. Do you yeah, go in freshman year? They they have you test your like um, how much you can bench and how ju- how you can jump and how fast you can run. Oh my and god! All these things that don't involve playing football, right? And in those things. I was in. I was either the number one or the number two person in the freshman class, and so they were like, "We'd like you to play tight end, which is a very complicated position. It's a receiver position, but also a blocking yep. position, and and it's it requires a lot of n- knowledge. And so they put me at tight end, and within a few practices, it was it was clear that I was out of my element and and then i just started um feeling these these uh feelings of hopelessness and and wanting to sleep like and and i would go to the practices and then i would sleep and there would be another practice and i would go to that and then i would sleep some more and i would sleep until the next day and then on the weekends i would i would go home to my parents house and sleep and then somebody suggested in my family you should talk to the trainer because i this sounds like depression. <laughs> and so I went to the to the trainer and he sent me to this man who was a therapist and and within 6 seconds of talking to me it was like yeah you have a, a major depressive disorder and and it was I spent the next 4 years in in college um figuring that out and and being treated for that but it was it was a blessing i stopped playing football after the after my freshman year yeah with the and and what what always has baffled me to this day is when i went into the coach's office and and quit after the after the spring game after he had screamed at me and during the spring game for missing a block i went into his office on monday and i said and i felt like all right i'm gonna do everybody a favor and stop playing football and then he tried to talk me out of it, and I was like, "All right, he's just he's just being kind." And then he called my father, and my father tried to talk me out of it, yeah. and and I just remember thinking there is there definitely is a disconnect. I wasn't as bad as I my brain was telling myself, right? But I had also realized that my mindset was not conducive to being a dominant physical presence on a on a football team. It mm-hmm. it I I did I didn't. I didn't enjoy that. That brought me that brought me no joy. I, I mm-hmm. say in the book, and and I've been told this is a pretty good sentence that um, it was college football was a dream come true, but not my dream. <laughs> that was that. Yeah, that's what it felt like. Right. It was like I should be really excited over this, but I'm really just frightened and and weary. You know, when you you try something and it doesn't work, and then you like maybe you have that like feeling of like shame or guilt. Yeah. Whatever. Oh yeah. But like in this case, you just were just you're like, oh, this is, I'm done. I'm I'm happy to be out of this. Yeah. Although there was so much shame involved yeah. too that I had that I felt that I had failed, and also that I had blown an opportunity, and that there were there was a lot of there was a lot of ambivalence and and regret and what and I and I don't know how much people should put weight on their dreams but occasionally i will have a dream where i'm back at football practice and i'm like yeah. how the f- did i make this yeah decision again after what happened and i'm going to have to go in and quit again and then i wake up and i'm like i'm 53 years old yes this happened 34 years ago why what is the what is my brain working through to me it it sounds like it's like it's that part of you that wishes uh you were normal yeah wow uh and that part of you that could be like everybody else wow you know that could go in and say yeah i'm gonna play football and (laughs) and fuck it let's go knock some heads around my father my father used to try to make me play football when i was younger because my father he had a trial for the Patriots and, uh, and he was, he was really good in high school and then he tried yeah. out for the Patriots, or whatever. So then when it came time for me, he was like, you got to play football. You got to yeah, play football. Yeah, yeah. And my mother was, I was like, I told my mother, I don't want to play football. I don't want to hit, you know, right, I don't yeah. like that. So then did you lose your scholarship? Um, no, because I had an advocate in, there was this thing called learning resources for student athletes. Yeah. And, and he, he sort of, was the liaison between the team and you passing your courses and getting getting uh, tutors and extra time if you were traveling or or just coordinating and make sure you stay 
eligible, but also if you you if you took advantage of it, you could get a lot of advantages yeah. from from the learning. There were a lot of resources. He went to the he went to the president of the university, Father Monin, and <laughs> with my therapist, and he and, <laughs> and he said, um, "You should honor this kid's scholarship." Um, and uh, we're we're prepared to resign if you if you don't. And really, and, yeah. And I remember thinking, why are they wasting their <laughs> time over over me? And and I I think that you you you're a nice person too. I I think we we um, we downplay how unusual it is for certain people to meet truly nice people it in certain me. areas. It, and it shocks me when right, I meet somebody nice. Yeah. It's the same thing. And they try to be nice to other nice people. Yeah. And, and we don't think it's much of an asset or, or t- anything. Wow. So you got to keep the scholarship. Yeah. And I say that about my wife as, as well. Like she's, she's this very kind, smart, incredibly intellectual person and and people throughout her life try try to help her and she she discounts her part in that uh, uh, how, oh how do you right mean, how like do you just mean? teachers would always look after her growing up because she grew up in in very poor circumstances in in trenton new jersey and they would look out for her and give her guidance and get her into programs and 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 i'm like yeah because you're you stand out because of your personality and the fact that you're smarter than everybody around you. Yeah. And you, and you bring books everywhere you go. Right, right, People, right. Especially teachers and, and educators, that's that's unusual to them. And you're grateful. It's it's just How yeah. long have you been married? We got married during the pandemic. Oh wow. Yeah. So since twenty twenty. So, later so in three life years. You got yeah. Married. Yeah. 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 But we'd been together since I think twenty fourteen. And so then did you make your way to Nick's comedy stop after that? Is that what <laughs> yes, happened? Yes. Well, I was gonna take a guess. Yes. So I was like, Well, I know I know the geographical location. Yeah, of My course. grandmother had a house right near BC. I used to go to Nick's comedy stop when I was in high school with some friends and yeah. I was just in awe Who would you see there? Of the comedians. Um Exactly who you would think I would Dennis see. Dennis Leary. Steve, Steve, Steve Sweeney, Sweeney. Don Gavin. Don Gavin. Lenny Clark. Lenny Clark. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Wendy Liebman. Wendy Liebman was so yeah. funny. Uh, it is so funny. This guy named Rich Seisler, who's passed away, who's incredibly yep. funny, and and who was a uh, Kevin Knox. Yep. Kevin Knox was another guy we would see there and then repeat it. The great thing was you could repeat their jokes to each other on Monday at school. It was so much <laughs> right. fun. And then and then on October eleventh, nineteen ninety three, I did an open mic there and and the host was this guy Billy Martin, who's now like one of the head writers or executive producers on on uh the, well Bill Maher's show. I'm not a fan of anymore, but um Oh, oh yeah, he, he became very polarizing he, to everybody. He, yeah. Yeah. Well he became he used to make fun of the the guys who were saying the kids to the today. Yeah. Right. And now he's saying kids today and it and it's just yes. it's hypocritical and 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 disappointing. What is your life? like now you go on the road you, what do you do you do yeah i mean I, I i'm so grateful and if if i could ask for anything from the universe it would be more of the same yeah which is i i tour from september to may and take probably 3 on average 3 weekends away from home doing shows and then in the summer, I, like last summer, I worked on a new, a new hour to tour with the with the book. Yep. And I really like going out and doing long shows. And then I've been doing meet and greets after the shows yep. to sign the books, and yep. that's been very gratifying. And I play basketball every morning, either by myself or with uh, three or four other middle aged men, um, or short young people. <laughs> I can um, sometimes my height can allow me to to hang with short young people, <laughs> and so H- half court and, uh, or full half court sometimes full court, and and so I really enjoy that. And then I read I read a lot. My wife and I, she doesn't she doesn't work outside the home. She do, works in yeah. in the house mostly. So we get to spend a lot of time together. And I just I couldn't and and we're we're in the early stages of planning a family, but right. I, I, I mean, 
we're playing marriage on the easiest level in that we don't have kids. So it's yeah. incredibly enjoyable and we make, yeah, that's we make a lot of great decisions. It's very fun. And, yeah. and so I'm, I'm, I mean, enormously grateful. Does she go with you on the road? She, to the cool places. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> she doesn't, she doesn't often go to the Midwest in the yeah, winter if I'm yeah. there, but she'll yeah. like, a, she'll come out to LA and, and Hawaii and, and Florida. And, yeah. and, um, I wanted, I wanted her to see Chicago and like, yeah. she came to me with me to Toronto last summer. Uh-huh. I, I shot a special that that's coming out on, on max, um, on December twenty first, I don't know when this will air, but and and so you're you're planning a family that I have to do the same thing. I, I have a fiance. Oh, congratulations! She's a lot younger than me. Thank you. So excited! And I have two kids already. Right. And uh, but they're like uh, fourteen and seventeen, wow. and um, they're gone. They're just like yeah. I remember, I I had a girlfriend in college, and and her mother was, I wasn't even aware of the of the anti semitism going on there, <laughs> but. I remember she said to me, and it was almost as if she was saying something that was positive, which a lot of bigotry is sounds like something positive, and then you're like, wait a minute. She said, um, Jewish men make great husbands. Of course, they all have mistresses. Yeah. I was like, what the, what the fuck? And, and I saw it as a, as a, oh, yes, we do make good husbands, and then this lingering thing of, oh, she's completely out of her mind yeah 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 and and i'm uh, i had that i was the only um i was the only jew in my school in medfield whoa yeah it was hilarious oh my gosh like and you're blonde so people feel they can talk about jews in front of you yeah my nickname was wedge which is jews fell backwards so i'd walk down the hallway and they'd be like wedge wedge and i wow and you know when it's happening i had some guys on the football team who referred to me as gefilta (laughs) <laughs> which I thought was pretty clever for football players, clever, but really Wedge, good. that's cool too. Wedge is good. <laughs> and then, you know, that you met you well, while it's happening, you're like, Oh, it was great. I yeah. have a nickname. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they're accepting me. I'm one of them. And, yeah, yeah. and I'm going to show them that we can be the cool Jews. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. yeah. yeah but they're, and then yeah. you look back and you're like, Oh, yeah. every day was a hate crime. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was not necessary. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, um, but then there is that line too of like, I don't know. There's that line too of like, uh, it wasn't done in like hatred either. No, I don't. You know? I don't think so. There, there, there was a there was a warmth within it, right? And at the at the center yeah. that they didn't. But it here's the thing: not all of us are as. Some people are more sensitive about that, and and they yeah. shouldn't be grouped together. I don't. I don't want because I was okay with it for everybody to feel they have to yes. be okay with it, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. So I understand where people would be like, like it might not offend yeah. you if yeah, you threw yeah, a yeah. penny on the ground yeah. and told you to pick it up, <laughs> right? But yeah, yeah, somebody yeah, else yeah, would. Yeah, yeah, and and they they also um, <laughs> might not have the the history or the context of of. No idea yeah, 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 what the history yeah, of the context yeah, is of that. Yeah. No, no, no. Because they're 14 and right, they, yeah, yeah. they have no idea. Yeah. yeah so my, my mother was, is Jewish. My father is, I don't know, Catholic. Okay. And, uh, and so we just grew up like, I guess we were Jewish. Yeah. But, but I didn't really go to temple or anything because we couldn't afford temple. Right. Temple was very expensive. <laughs> so expensive. I was, we were able to get, uh, well, I was able to get, I don't know what my, what the situation was with my brothers was probably less expensive but the jewish federation of the north shore was very generous in paying for my religious education if you made uh, my mother was a single mom and so was bringing in no she worked at a, at a hallmark store yeah at the mall and that was her income and and some alimony but literally 110 dollars a week in alimony and then a Thirty hours a week at three fifty five, an hour. Oh my god! With three boys, so the Jewish Federation, yeah, came through for us. It's a, it's a, as 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 much as Jews are always decried for being cheap or stingy. It's like the, the we can be very charitable as well. In general, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Such nonsense. No, it's nonsense. Yeah, and and so how long have you been doing stand up? Thirty years. Yeah. 30 years this past October. What was your, what was your first, like, big break? 
JFL New Faces, Just uh-huh. for Laughs, the yeah, Montreal laugh. Comedy Festival, in which I went up there with five minutes, and I, I was a, a substitute teacher at the high school I went to. Um, in Peabody? Yeah. No way. Yeah, and I was, and a lot of my teachers were still there from when I had, had them, so I got to meet them in a totally different circumstance, and right. it, was, it was wonderful. And then... <laughs> And then I went up and did the Montreal Comedy Festival. I was still living at home and came away. And that was back when they used to give stand-up comedians with five minutes huge deals. Yes. Like I got, I got a quarter of a million dollar deal out of Montreal. And then the next year I got another similar one at CBS. First one was with Greenblatt General Ari Studios. Greenblatt General Ari, I remember. They, yeah, they were, they were <laughs> I remember that very name. generous and, and really smart guys. And what was and the, the sitcom that you decided it was to based try? On a, it was based on a guy who lived at home with his mother. <laughs> and, 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 and then the and next worked year, as a substitute was, teacher? Yeah, and worked yeah. as a substitute teacher, yeah. but had dreams. Yeah, yeah. And he had a dream. Yeah. And, and, but it was at the height of, well, after the the. It was after Seinfeld came out, but still they were reluctant to make a comedian the star of a show. It's been done. Yeah. yeah. And and since then it's been done several times and done well, but at the time they didn't want to do that, so you'd have to come up with a different thing. But the, what I didn't understand was that eventually they they might pass on the pilot yeah. and, and you, you would just be like, oh, I have this money, but I, I'm still an unknown. And, and that was before you could build an audience through the the internet or or at the yeah. or at the origins of of that and so it was very difficult so i i i spent a lot of time after that um after that money ran out just just eking out a living with with some road work yep and and an occasional um tv spot that would enable me to do a, a headlining yep. a headlining set is there anybody that like took you on the road I mean, I, I I did go out with Dane Cook occasionally when he would do. Wait, weren't you improvs. a part of that tour gas? Yeah, I was show? part of that tour gas. So we had gave, Dane on the show here. Oh, okay, he gave me a lot of. He was so of, good. A lot of work early on, and then, but then, I did Last Comic Standing, and that was the yes. other break. That was really helpful to get me to be not a not an opening act, but a, a headliner myself. And that was how'd you do on that Last was very Comic? Helpful. I came in third. Behind this guy John Heffron and John Heffron, Alonzo right. Bowden, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, and and that was that was really that was really fun, and I was a little bit famous for a few weeks. Uh-huh. It was, yeah, huh. Yeah, and it, it, was it cool. helped your like bookings and stuff. Yeah, and, totally. totally. And, and then when the internet came around, how did you? Do you have a podcast that you do or no? No, no I don't have a. a but you just got podcast. your clips out there. I just and, I told the story of abbreviating the states down to two letters. Oh, I've seen that a fake, yeah, a fake yes. documentary, and then and that that got me a like after that I found that there were at least thirty places in the country where I could sell five hundred tickets, and and it changed my Off life. Off that bit, yeah, really, yeah, it was it was something else, and and out of out of nowhere, really, because then you don't find out right away that everybody is going to see it. It kind of builds and people share it. And then, and then I did that. But then in the midst of it, I had this breakdown and that was my other big break. <laughs> you had a breakdown. Yeah. What I, and I, I, I went f-ing nuts, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's from bottle rocket. Um, I, I, yeah, I had this two and a half year depression and, but then I was hospitalized and received this this very much maligned treatment that is extraordinarily effective called electroconvulsive therapy, oh, and wow. and it it uh, it rebooted, recharged, or however you want to put it, my brain. Is it a one time thing or several no? I, times? I received I think twelve treatments in hospital and then several out of hospital, and it it led to it wasn't immediate, but it led to. Uh, recovery and a remission that has been so durable. I haven't had an episode since incredible when I came out of it in 2017. And I, I'd always had rec- re- relapses and, and short lived uh, remissions, but this has been extraordinarily durable. And, and on the other side of it, when I recovered that that's when I wrote the, this great depressed that Judd Apatow produced and 
Mike Bonfiglio directed, and it was after the Shandling and before the 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 Carlin documentaries, yeah. and it was on HBO, and that and that 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 was really that that brought me to the 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 it next got, level, which is like doing theaters and yeah, that probably um, pulled and you. writing books. Yes, right before that, nobody wanted me to write a book, and then that came out, and I had enough of an audience where I publishers see. came and said, "Does he have a book idea?" And I said, "Well, I have this one idea of a memoir of." everything I can remember from kindergarten through 12th grade in terms of, uh, I have a, a memory that's that people tell me is, is, uh, creepy. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I can remember d- details from the first day of school and names and, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's unusual. And, and it's not like Mary Lou Henner. No, because hers is, is almost like a computer and, yeah. and, has dates and things like that. I'm able to look back on when I think this happened and find a holiday and be like, Oh, it happened on September 21st because we celebrated this holiday on that, on that day. And so I can remember like when, for instance, my first girlfriend and I broke up or, or the the labor day, uh, the first day of school in this year. So I, I had to do a little bit of research, but I could remember details and stories and and i just had this habit throughout my life of thinking to myself when certain events good or bad would happen but meaningful i would think oh i'll never i'll never forget this and oh. and and i was and i was true to my word and it, and it made writing the the memoir very very or easier than i think a incredible lot of skill to have, have for it. a memoir yeah it's been really yeah, it, yeah. and 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 people have been Making very nice comments about that. Yeah. So, like, when you get a show on HBO with Judd Apatow, your your special, that probably pulls you out of the depression too. One would think, but I was already <laughs> I was already out of it. Okay. So it just it just felt almost like a like a dream come true, like and my dream, like to have an HBO special yes. and and all the also this feeling of. If you've ever been suicidal and then something happens after, yeah. that's good. You're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I didn't. It almost feels like that. Have you ever <laughs> read that that short story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, I think it's called? No, tell me about it. Okay, so it starts off and this man is being hanged. And then <laughs> he uh, escapes. Yeah. And it's O. Henry, I think. Anyhow, he escapes and uh, reunites with his wife and has a great reunion. And then you find out that this was all in his imagination as he was falling from the point where you're uh, flying in the air and the rope <laughs> catches. Yeah. We should probably do a spoiler alert there. Because <laughs> you should, everybody should read an occurrence of the Owl Creek Bridge. But it's like, it's it's been done... Like a version, you know how they do that? It's like, this is an Owl Creek Bridge, but it's not set during the Civil War, and it's something yeah. like that. And and also, it was like a Twilight Zone episode or an Alfred Hitchcock, and it, it's just, it's it's a lot of people would be aware of it, but that's what it almost felt like. Like, I'm being shown, or at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. he's shown what could have happened if he had not lived. Yeah. And I was being shown what could happen if I lived, only I only I had lived. Yes, and and it and it just feels so great. Uh, and and like yeah, I'm playing with chills, like I'm playing man. with house money for the past for the fa- past seven years because I talk about it in the in the book and I had never told anybody about this before. But I um since I was a little kid, I couldn't imagine a scenario where I where my life didn't come to an end at my own hands. I just I always. I always felt like something is going to happen. It's just a matter of whether it's my wife dies or my wife leaves me or I lose a child or my child <gasps> hates me. And it just, oh and and so that, that uh, mental illness runs in my family. So it wasn't something that I dreamed up or, or found out of thin air. It was, it was something that was, was calling to me. It's yeah. really scary, Gary. It is pretty scary. And to go into to the the arts like <laughs> i mean 
that's just a really tough road. It is. A, it to is go a, to to go to a stand up show if you're already depressed and maybe right. not do well. Yeah, because the crowd isn't right, right. that night. Yeah, I mean, that's dangerous. But that was but that was one thing that I learned that was so important while I was recovering because it's not it's not an overnight thing. It's gradual and it's not linear. But once I did re- recover, I remember one of the decisions I made, and it was it was helpful that I came across this this quote by Thomas Beckett in which he talks about. It says, um, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And so fail better became my mantra. I said, you can go on stage and as long as you try something new or something risky and that's success. You may not get a laugh, but you should feel that next time you will do a little bit better. And that's all you should hold yourself to. Mm-hmm. And so I used to have a bad set and it would ruin the next day and every day after until I had a good set. And then that wouldn't, and the good sets didn't last long. I wouldn't feel good about it. It would be like, well, what's going to happen to the next one? Right. And then this new, this new idea was just, oh, it's just part of being an artist is that you will occasionally swing and miss or you will, you will um, just fall on your face. And that's, that's actually a good thing because you'll learn something from it. And sometimes you will take a big risk and it will work out. And, Mm -hmm. and, and if you had held yourself to perfection or not failing, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have given it a shot. So it's, it's just, it's, it's so important, but our, our, our psyches are not, are not always um, cooperative Mm -hmm. in, in that. Yeah. So you have a good handle on it now, though, right? Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm, that you found this therapy. I found this therapy, and I also found what the alternative is. Yeah. I can either do everything I can every day in terms of exercise and eating right, and not yep. drinking, and and not smoking pot, and not smoking and, pot. Yeah, and and not getting involved in gossip or comparing myself to other yeah. performers or worrying about money. I I can do all the things I need to do, or I can be on the precipice of, I mean, oblivion, right, of suicide. Right. So it's it's just I. I I'm, I mean, I don't, we all have those days where we're like, I don't want to get out of bed. I want to spend the end, entire day in bed. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, eh, it's a slippery slope. Was there somebody that helped you through that? I mean, there were a lot of people. A I lot think of comics. My, yeah. I, th- I think my psychiatrist was, psychiatrist was very helpful and my therapist. And, and I had a really close friend from growing up that was, that was in, incredibly helpful. And, and, um, I, I am friends with this uh, family, the Koppelman family in New York City, yeah, and they the were. Koppelmans. Oh, you do the writer? Yeah, I, mean, I know them well. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're friends with my ex-wife. the The wife, uh, Amy, is school friends with my ex-wife. Oh, you know, interesting. And Amy, yeah, they're, yeah. they're <laughs> Gary. I got to tell you something. There was a time. Now, my, my my condition is not on the level of what yours, but I was bipolar for a while. Oh, okay, and they sat me down too. Wow. Yeah, they took me to dinner once, and they were like, you have to get on medication, blah, 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 and they changed my life. The same f- two people. That's incredible. At a Chinese Amy, restaurant on the Upper West Side. That's so funny, because Amy is the person I talk about in the special. I said, my friend Amy said, you have four years left to live <laughs> if you don't do something. <laughs> and she says, you have to go into the hospital, and you have to get this this electroconvulsive therapy treatment. Good on them, huh? Oh my gosh! They're nice. They're great. Isn't people. that incredible how we intersect with these special people, and they're the same people? <laughs> yeah, I tried to. Um, I was like bipolar for a while. The thing about suicide for me is like, I would never be brave enough to. Oh yeah, to do it. No, I I I totally get that, <laughs> and and I like I, what I mean. One of the one of my attempts was this, uh, I talk about it early in the book, so it's not a spoiler. One of my suicide attempts was taking a plastic bag that, that my new toaster had come in and putting it over my head, but then it was immediately revealed that this was not a plastic bag, but a plastic sleeve. And so my <laughs> head went out the top of it, 
And I, I mean, it, it's hilarious, right? In retrospect, but in the moment, it's like, oh, f- you idiot, you stupid idiot! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I don't think I can think of anything funnier. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my god! I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. I'm. I mean, that makes me happy because I always used to think, man, if I come out of this. And we're able to redeem it in some way, and and as comedians and artists, we right we redeem it through through sharing it and having people feel less alone and and less um, like we were talking about earlier, more normal. Well, I'm sure the people that have have found you in these theaters and stuff and your books, they're yeah they struggle with the same thing yeah they're right they're yeah and they're incredibly grateful and sometimes we hug each other and cry and it's really yeah. it's a special connection that i didn't get with strict observational humor <laughs> right when you're when you're doing when you're doing these these sort of quote unquote vulnerable stories yep. it's a different level of connection and it and it's really edifying it's kind of like your 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 carlin move yeah <laughs> yeah yeah going yeah. deeper yeah, digging a little bit deeper, yeah. and, and but but a also result. being lucky enough to have an audience that was willing to join me. Yeah, I, I mean, there there, I can imagine a certain type of comedian like the, J- Jeff Dunham is not going to be able to bring out a puppet that is is bipolar or, or um, OCD or something like that. Um, <laughs> Ahmed, uh, the OCD. It sounds like a parody. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you think about like mental health, like? My friend had a theory. He was like, "Oh, he's like, he's like, well, what, all these kids that shoot up schools and stuff." And this is this is what this is. My friend is younger too. He's like twenty seven. He's like, "Oh, it's the internet." Oh, interesting. It's one hundred percent the internet. He's like, people see what what they don't have. Oh, they um, because I mean, these things didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, thirty it's, years ago, not as much. It's not all the internet but the internet isn't helping it's not helping the at internet all, is isn't, it? isn't helping i mean and and in some ways it's like a, a lot of technology there are there are some blessings and then there's a lot of things unintended unintended consequences that are that are alarming and disturbing and sad right. and and just I, i've just heard over the years the the idea and kurt vonnegut always puts a lot of things in the best way at least for me he just talks about uh, he talks about alcoholics anonymous in particular and he says it's it's an effective he feels it's like a religion he says and it's very effective because it addresses one of the main things people struggle with which is loneliness yeah it's giving you this support system in nearly every city everywhere that you can connect with and find people who are connected with you and will listen to you and share with you and know how you feel. And, and he says, and, and I don't know if this families are, are a mixed bag at best, Yeah. but he says, we used to get that from our extended families that we would have large families and, and people would be connected. And, and he talked about anthropological type things of societies that have um, huge extended families in which they're really close. And he had this really interesting idea of giving everybody, uh, having the social security, um, division of the, of the government, give everybody a, a, a middle name, an additional name. And it would be based, there would be a number of these. Maybe you would be, your new middle name would have a marigold and mine would be the iris or whatever. Yeah. And it, we could connect with other people in different areas or even in our hometown who were marigolds or irises. Yeah. And we would have this artificial family and they could treat us well or they could treat us poorly. I mean, it's almost like old man's lodges and things like that or, yeah. or, or what the, the PTA used to be or, yeah. and things. And I, 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 I like the idea of people being kinder to each other. However, we uh-huh. we figure it out. You can't really legislate it, but I I just know how I feel when I haven't talked to somebody all day, mm-hmm. and I do see somebody and talk to them, and it's just like it's joy. It's it's yeah. It's really lovely catching up with somebody. Yeah, yeah I've I've fallen yeah. into that myself where I just um 
just stay here and work. Yeah. And don't see but it's, people. It's and, part of my recovery is, is making sure. I mean, in early on, I used to just accept invitations from people I would meet in meet and greet lines. They would say, do you want to get coffee? I would say, yes, I do want to get coffee. It'll get me out of bed and it'll keep me from isolating. So I would I would meet strangers. You would? Essentially for, for coffee. And now I don't really have time and i also usually am able to afford somebody to tour with to uh -huh. to spend some time with so that's really good yeah yeah but isolation is is a depressant guys today's podcast is brought to you by seat geek the one and only seat geek the best ticketing app out there the ticketing app that i have on my phone at all times we've seen so many shows because of seat geek um you can you can get sports tickets uh concert tickets magicians uh, live theater. Oh, you could see really? live theater. Yeah, you could see live theater with SeatGeek. Um, and it's so great. I have the app right on my phone. I go, I buy the tickets. I, I just show my phone when I walk in. You walk right in uh, to the concert. We saw Harry Styles with SeatGeek. Um, I saw Dave Chappelle with SeatGeek. SeatGeek. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's, it is just the best ticketing app out there. You have to have it. You have to have it on your phone. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Just go download the app and just have it sitting there. And when the time strikes, you will see, you'll, you won't know that uh, your favorite artist is in town. And uh, you can just get the tickets and, and go right to the show. Isn't that cool, Naveen? That's really cool. Yeah. And right now, guys, if you use my code NASH, you're going to get $20 off your first order. An incredible deal. Uh, right off the top uh, that SeatGeek is offering, uh, and I don't have to tell you, SeatGeek has been, was the first sponsor on this podcast. They sponsored all my videos. Uh, we've just been to so many shows because of them, and they're an incredible, incredible partner. So please, go support them. Go support SeatGeek. And, uh, and my thanks to them for sponsoring this podcast. I'm so fascinated by everything you've been through. Like, oh. I had no idea. So for the two and a half years, you weren't doing anything? I was... You my wife says, and... And it's hard to believe, but it makes sense that I wouldn't have any idea. She was like, it was like you were, you were dying. You were spending so much time catatonic on the, on the couch and not talking. And, and the interesting thing is there was a period of time where I was able to go out and do shows and I would, I would travel, do the show, sleep right up until the last minute I had to be at the show and then do the show. And I'd, do well and nobody could really tell other than maybe I hadn't shaved or my my shirt was wrinkled right and then I would go back to the hotel and I would wake up feeling horrible again and and miserable and then I'd go on to the next and it was just uh yeah I don't but but I was so fearful of of um going completely broke and not making my rent and yeah and everything that I had to I had to tour and then it, it became unsustainable and I just uh I stopped. I stopped working for a while. What makes Judd Apatow so great? Um, I'm a huge fan, but I, I'm yeah. saying like, what? What is he? I, he? This is somebody that has had his hand in yeah. everything. Yeah. The, the the movies he made. I I loved the movies he oh, made, and then he made I the docs, and I was awesome. like, the docs, the docs blow are, the movies away. The docs are awesome. I think I think part of it is he's very sensitive and uh -huh. compassionate, and so he. And he learned a lot, I think, probably from Gary Shandling in terms of the Larry Sanders show yeah. and that type of mindset where funny, yes, but also you should get punched in the gut at some point. Uh -huh. And and there should be that that type of, of heart. And it doesn't have to be funny the entire time. And it can be a bummer. And it can be, uh, th there can be anger and there can be sadness. and and th But there should be great jokes and... And also, he cares about the words. Like he's a he's a writer, and he's smart. Uh -huh. And and also he he takes he takes a lot of that Gary Shandling, where Gary Shandling gave a lot of people a lot of breaks. He I think he took that to to heart and and does that. I mean, there uh -huh. there's so many people like he's he's Amy lifted Schumer. up and and uh -huh. and um, Pete um, Davidson, Davidson. Yep. yeah, and just I don't do you remember. At Grand Latch and Alari, you were probably friendly with with um, Liz Melcher. Yeah, yeah. So she was like a casting assistant, and then there was this guy who was an assistant to either David or Bob, uh, named Judah, yeah. who's now um, uh, Judah Miller. One of the part, yeah, one of the partners with with Judd at that yes. at the Apatow company. So yes. I mean, he's just 
he's returned the favor that Gary Shandling, I guess, if you consider giving Judd Apatow a writing gig a favor. Right. But he he's returned that. I mean, over and over again, he's been he's been that person for so many people, including me and Pete Holmes and Amy, like yeah. you said. And yeah, it's really not. And we know not everybody does that. A lot of people no. shut the door behind them. And and uh, make friends with other celebrities, yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah, yeah. and don't have the time for the the. And I get it, but it's really nice when people when people do reach out and lift people up. And, and what, what really were your favorite special. things? What were your favorite things about Shandling and the Shandling Doc? Um, I loved that he was writing down all these thoughts he had about, say, the comedy store, but what he had to do, be more himself on stage, yeah. and, that, and that it wasn't so much about the jokes, and and it was about the jokes. The jokes were incredible, but he would say it was more about his personality and being more himself and being comfortable and just his, his rise. And also, and like we said about, like I just said about Judd, the pain that he experienced with losing his brother. Insane. Insane. If you guys don't know, he, Gary Shanling, had a younger brother. An older brother, a, Barry. An older brother. Who had six, cystic fibrosis. Who died. Yeah. And then what happened? And then they never mentioned it again. He didn't go to the funeral. He was never allowed to grieve outwardly. And so, I mean, if that doesn't fuck you up. And Insane. Yeah. What I was always curious about Shanling was, like, when he made that, he could have had the Tonight Show. Yeah. But then he yeah. made that left turn to make the Larry Sanders yeah. show. Yeah. To to make that, what do you think about that choice? Like, what 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 makes someone to make that choice that to say, oh, I don't need to have twenty five million people watching yeah. me. I'm going to go to HBO and make a show about the show. I'm I'm so glad you asked me that because <laughs> I thought about it yesterday. You did. One of the great things in in that documentary was they asked really interesting, smart people about Gary Shandling, and one of the people was Conan O'Brien. Yeah, and he said, "I was uh, up against Gary for having the late night show, and was convinced it was going to be Gary Shandling." But it, Conan says, "I remember thinking Gary likes to do things perfectly and have them be these pieces of art." And how the hell do you do that five nights a week yes. for 40 weeks a, a year and, and not go crazy because you got to get it done every day. Yeah. And he said, so he didn't think that was in, and, wow. and, and that's something I, that's, that's. Conan I knew think, he had the job. I Yeah, but I think that's the reason why Gary didn't want to do the yeah, Tonight yeah. Show because it would be, Good or the, the late night show, it would be, um, he seemed to be a person who wanted to get it just right and was, and was uh, outraged when it wasn't done right, and and could be very difficult. Are you more that, that way? Would you would you not want a, a a Seth Meyers spot or something like that? I don't become difficult <laughs> if it's not perfect. Uh -huh. I do get to a level where I I know I'm never going to be happy with it. But if the people are around me saying this is good enough, yeah. then it's good enough. Right. So I have that, which is which is healthy. But I. Listen, I would figure out how to do the late night with <laughs> Seth Mars. I would figure it out. It would be so exciting and right. so fun. And how do you turn that down? But I, I know in my thing, I, I'd rather do less of what I do, but do it a little bit better. So instead of doing a special every year, yeah. which probably isn't even a possibility, or every two years, I'd rather give it three years and do it much better and be stronger. And and I, I, I worked very hard on the on the book and and didn't include anything from any of my acts or shows or anything like that. I wanted to write a yeah, I wanted to write a real a real book because I I just treasure books and I and I admire authors so much that I didn't want to I didn't want to do wrong by this thing that had brought me so much joy and and comfort over the years. So I took it very very seriously and 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 I mean uh, stewed over every word choice and every sentence and 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 so many rewrites, but I, I finally was able to. I, I remember somebody saying, "You don't really finish a work of art; you abandon it at some point." And be like, "All right, it's it's good enough," and and I might be making it worse by p paying more attention to it because uh, there's also a point where you lose the objectivity and something becomes better because it's new. 
yeah. and not because it's better. Yeah. The book is done, but you go yeah. back and you look at it and you're like, yeah. oh, I can make this better, but it's, yeah. you don't, it, you don't like it as much as you did right. a month ago. Right. But the one thing I did find, and it, and I think it was, it was predictive of whether it was going to be a good book was that there were certain chapters I hadn't read in months and I'd forgotten certain things that I had written. I was like, Oh man, I can't believe I came <laughs> up with that. That's pretty good. And so that, so I knew people would like it because I, I liked it as an objective person yeah, rather than the person who had written it because I had forgotten certain things. And you do that with your when you're writing over three years. Man, I'm so glad you're doing well. I can't oh, even, I, I have no so idea that you went through all that. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. It's just like, you know, and but when I would, when I would, uh, when I would see your clips and stuff, like, man, he's so funny. Or then when I would talk to you, but I would always think, and I had no idea about whatever you were going right, through, yeah, but I would yeah. always think, he's not, this guy's not built for stand-up. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I used to think that. Because I went through that when I would try to do stand-up. I'd be like, I'm like, I, I'm not, I'm not a guy that's like, okay, give me the spot. No, I want yeah, it. And yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, yeah, I'm just yeah. not that way. So I always yeah. thought that myself in you. I was like, I wonder how he, yeah. he deals with it. Yeah. I, I used to think about that a lot. I used to think, especially when I was depressed, I would think, I picked the wrong thing because there's so many, there, there's so much disappointment and there's so much waiting and there and there's right. so much, compa like the funny thing is I I always used to say, if you don't get an accounting job, that's fine. You don't have to see a billboard of the person who did get the job yeah. on your on your <laughs> right, on your right, way right. to your job at Starbucks the next day, right? right? right and right. that and that's what what actors and comedians have to see. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. the the but you audition for things. And then, which is a job interview, right? Yeah. And you don't get it. And the next thing you know, the person is is in your television, literally. Billboard's the worst. <laughs> I was on a billboard. I, I was forgot on a, all about the billboard I was on a scene billboard once. When I was living in New York. Oh, really? I was on a billboard once. It never brought more problems. Really? To my life. Tell me than why. being on a billboard. Tell me why. I was on a bill we were on a billboard in front, uh, on Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. above Saddle Ranch. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's one prime, of the great. Prime, prime, yeah, it's one of the great billboards spot. of all time. Sure, it's in the Billboard Mount Rushmore. Yeah, which Fuck. is just a big billboard. Oh, fucking forty texts. Hey man, why why haven't you called me? Uh, what uh, the fuck, man? Like you were supposed to shoot this day. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, trouble. It just brought trouble. What was the group you were in? And I remember going to see this with Liz actually, where it was. Price, Nash, and Blyden. Yeah, Blyden. Michael Blyden. Michael Blyden. Blyden. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a director now. Oh, my gosh. He directs comedies now. Oh, that's comedy incredible shows. because that, I remember being blown away by that. That was so much fun. What, yeah. I forget. It was the three. You guys were so awesome. Yeah, it was yeah, fun. We, so we that, I had like a, there was a sketch group. We moved out here to LA together. Yeah. yeah. We had a little deal at Fox. Yeah. Met my ex-wife on the Fox deal. Wow. Got married out of it. So cool. And, uh. And then the year we made our pilot was the year that I think the Lonely Island made a pilot uh, on Fox. And I think theirs got picked up. Yeah. Something like that. And it was the same thing. It was three white guys and we were just like, fuck. Uh, I know. Um, I, I mean, that's what, the, I wish really successful people would spend more time telling us about how helpful the timing was of their things or or just the luck of yep. a coin flip and not so much about how hard they worked because we all we all work hard yeah That's, yeah 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 and the, but for me for I me my, mine was such a combination of luck and working hard because yeah. i was i was completely broke i'm 50 now but when i was 43 or 42 uh i was completely broke i i was divorced I owed like eighty thousand dollars in taxes, and I went to the little room at the Improv and I did stand up, and um, anyway, it, it went good. It was a good yeah. night, you know. Yeah. And and right when I walked off stage, uh, a YouTuber walked up to me and he was like, "Oh, do you want to work? Come work with me." And 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 I was like, <laughs> I was like, what? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. He, he didn't say come work with me, but he said, "Oh, do you want to come make one sketch?" And I said, "Yeah, sure." So I go and I, and then uh. And then I started working with him for five years, and that was it. It's just completely, wow. yeah, completely. But yeah. it also is like uh, it also is preparation too. Yes. Like yes, of I course. had I had of twenty course. years of yes. things I had written and then delivering could and use bring, and bringing this this ethic 
to it. Yeah. What and, is the and, phrase? And Luck meets preparation. Opportunity. Something. No, no, no. Opportunity meets preparation. Opportunity I think. meets preparation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that, great. that was that was my story. But yeah. and then I got into YouTube, and I love it. I don't. I was on Last Comic. I have no memory of it. Oh, really? I have no. I think because I was so out of my element. Oh, interesting. And I was so like, I don't think I had more than five minutes of material. Okay. And even the five, I was like, mm. you know what I mean? Like maybe it would work. Yeah. Um, and I have no memory of it. I think I blacked it all out. That's so funny. It I wasn't think. your year, was it? I don't think, no. No. No, I would have remembered working with you. Because I can't I, remember yeah. one person I was on it with. That's and funny. And granted, I might have only been there for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think I, I made it to the top twenty, and that was it. That's really cool, though. I was a. The, <laughs> I don't Todd, think so. Todd Glass, no, top twenty is incredible. Hundreds and hundreds of people auditioned for that. Todd it's Glass, just, man. Todd, oh, Todd Glass so makes TikToks fun. now. Yeah. Oh, and they're, they're so funny. They're so funny. <laughs> I reached out to him. <laughs> oh, good. But it's not him that works the TikTok. It's someone okay. that works for him. All right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm sure I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. You ever see him do the Mater D? Maybe and it's like it's such a it's it's such a deep cut. Ah, oh, so good. He, he would just he would just get up on stage, and the first thing he would do is he would imitate like a real like an asshole Mater D. And he'd be like, "How's it going tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah." I don't know. I can't do it, but whatever. Oh, so good. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, Gary, thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you're doing well. Oh, so am I. Like, and, I, and thank you. That's so nice to hear. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the book is for having me on. The book is I called really Misfits. Appreciate. Misfit, misfit, and and the special is called Born on Third Base, and it and it's on Max, streaming on Max. Did you, is it when you put a special together? Is it a lot of editing in the in the um, you sitting there? Not that I had to do. No, they no, just cut it for it, you. It's produced by um, uh, Team Coco, Conan O'Brien's oh, company. Great. So they did all the the editing, and I got to approve of things and say this is great like right. I I will say one thing that happened that I couldn't get over is that I I hadn't remembered the way I started the show is cuz a lot of times you're just you're just improvising and they the final cut they worked in this thing that just it blew me away I I laughed mm -hmm. out loud at this thing I was familiar with because they brought it back around and cut it at the at the very end and so there's this payoff and twist that I'm just like holy shit I never would have come up with that so it's 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 unusual that Love that that they in a stand up special that something comes out that surprises you because yeah, you've been yeah. involved in the beginning so I'm Completely. I'm incredibly grateful so you yeah. started you when you taped the special you started improvising i started in improvising special? at the very beginning because, that takes a lot of balls okay so here's the thing i noticed that a lot of specials were starting as if the special had been going for a while right have you noticed yes, that I like norm mcdonald was the first one yeah and so i started talking about at any point now the special is going to start on the video but i don't know where it'll start and uh, but I noticed that a lot of comedians I admire are starting their show in the middle of the show. Right. And I said, and I find it very jazzy. <laughs> and and then there's a payoff to this thing that I do at the beginning, at the very end. And I, I was like, what the. F I never would have thought of that. Wow! And I was with this material a lot longer than the right. than the editors were, and so it, yeah, I so that was really special. I admire like um, how loose that is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but it's my fifth special, right? If it was my, <laughs> if it was my first special, I would have gone up and done it word for word. Right. And also, it was in Toronto, and Canadians are so nice. You really? <laughs> They're so, so generous. You just felt good and, yeah, so I just felt great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Gary, All uh, right. go, go check out. Thanks for having me over. I love your home. And we'll do this again sometime. Or we'll meet for a meal, like regular people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A meal. <laughs> okay. Go I love check it. out Gary Gallman. Go check out his special on uh on Max. It is out now. Okay. Bye guys. Thank you.